So the first speaker uh, is uh, concerned, Pierre Belek <laughs> from Montreal. He will uh, uh, tell us about dealing with clinical heterogeneity um, in the discovery of new biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Yes, the microphone works. So I'd like to start with a confession because I messed up a little. I was invited to give that talk. I said what I would talk about, and then I finally checked the program this morning. I realized I'm not in the right session. Um, <laughs> so I'm not going to talk about necessarily open science and reproducibility. So I thought I would change my talk to talk about that. But then I realized I don't have a huge lot to say about that because the way I deal with open science in my daily life is more like, you know, it's the way I do science, not a topic of research necessarily. So what I decided to do is keep talking about those things, which are more like machine learning and clinical neuroscience, but comment extensively on the open science and reproducibility aspect of that work. So <laughs> I, if you feel like you're being scammed, I, you're welcome to leave. I'm, so, I, I, I'm sorry. So... I'm uh, interested in uh, Alzheimer's disease. I've, uh, when I studied my lab uh, about five years ago, I decided to just focus on that application. And Alzheimer's disease, for those who don't uh, know what it is, it's um, the brain shrinks a lot, and um, people start suffering from major cognitive impairment, and uh, the, the most uh, dramatic form being dementia, where they're not able to function in their daily lives. And that picture, um, suggests that it's a really dramatic change that's going to be very easy to diagnose if you look at somebody's brain. And to some degree, it is the case. If you look really at somebody extremely healthy versus somebody who would be at sort of the late stage of dementia. But what's going on is that people now start to think that uh, the late stage of dementia are too uh, late to really uh, make an impact of the disease and that we should try to develop drugs to prevent rather than repair neurodegeneration. So what that graph shows is uh, on the y-axis, you have uh, the degree of uh, cognitive impairment. At the bottom, you would have dementia, mild to moderate. Here you have uh, the prodromal stage of uh, Alzheimer's disease, which is uh, uh, often referred to mild cognitive impairment, where people can still function in their daily life uh, but they're st starting to show uh, objective cognitive decline. And then there's a very long uh, preclinical phase where people don't have symptoms at all, but still have Alzheimer's pathology in their brain. And that can start 10, 20, maybe 30 years before the onset of dementia. So that's the way axis. On the X axis, you have years, and the points are clinical trials and what they're trying to recruit. And so back in, uh, like 10 years ago, people were... Uh, more like focusing on uh, um, patient population who suffer from dementia. And over time, they've started recruiting people at a uh, milder stage of dementia, prodromal stage, or even now we've got a prevention trial. We, we are recruiting people who don't have any sort of objective cognitive symptoms. But the thing is, like, how do you know you are actually enrolling people who have Alzheimer's pathology in their brain? Because at this stage, they don't have the like, completely shrinked brain that's easy to pick up on an MRI. So here comes biomarkers. That the, if you ever attend any Alzheimer talk, you will see that schematic. Um, I tried to be a bit creative here. I picked up the, the variant by Sperling et al., but it's really generally proposed by Cliff Jack. And uh, that tries to show sort of the cascade of events. It's a theoretical model. There's no data behind this, really. But here, what you have is uh, the clinical function. So really what, what is going to drive this uh, diagnosis of uh, mild cognitive impairment and dementia. That's going to pick up really late in the disease. And that's typically um, uh, uh, preceded by uh, the shrinkage of the brain. Uh, that's the blue line, uh, atrophy. And uh, a, a decline in cognitive abilities, but that is subjective. It, you still don't go, uh, you're not an outlier in terms of cognitive tests from a clinical perspective, but you do decline. You're you know, just worse than you were before, but still kind of normal. Um, and the idea is that that would be preceded by a accumulation of um, a proteins in the brain under uh, forms that they shouldn't take. That would be beta amyloid plex and um, tau neurofibrillary tangles. Uh, yeah. That's it. So the beta amyloid would start decades before. 
the tar would arrive uh, uh, a bit after. And in between here, you would have synaptic dysfunction, which maybe we can pick up with functional imaging. So the general idea is can we use a mix of those things and try to diagnose Alzheimer's disease and future progression to dementia quite early. So that's where the story gets complicated. Here, what I'm showing you are maps of cortical atrophy uh, in a fairly uh, large sample that's called uh, ANI. So here, that analysis is based on about 400 subjects mixing people who are cognitively normal, but uh, uh, elderly folks, and people who suffer from mild dementia. And uh, we generated uh, maps of grammatical density with SPM, and we just tried to measure and the quality of the contrast is not really good, but that matrix measure for each pair of subjects how similar their patterns of brain atrophy are. And highlighted along the diagonals are seven clusters of subjects where you've got relatively high value in terms of the similarity. So that means that the spatial organization, the topography of the atrophy in the brain look uh, more or less similar. So that's the, that quadrant. And here, what you have is a map of their atrophy after subtraction of the overall mean. So what you can see is, for example, this uh, pattern here, people are very thin or low gray matter uh, volume in the temporal pole. Okay, and this type of uh, uh, topography seems to be found more prominently in patients who suffer with dementia, which we did expect, you know, I, we know that Alzheimer's disease tends to uh, create atrophy in the temporal lobe. It's not the only one, though. You've got uh, this one, which is a more like posterior atrophy pattern. Uh, you've got that also uh, predominantly seen in, um, in patients with dementia. You're going to have this one, which is an atrophy that's really spread out all over the cortex. OK, so here, th that picture uh, seems to um, suggest that you'd have really seven discrete subtypes of atrophy in that population. Uh, I'm not just suggesting that. On the lower end, what you have is for each of those seven subtypes, a measure of similarity of that map, which is an average of a subgroup, and the map of an individual. And what you can see is that it's, it's more or less a continuum. So if a subject falls into a given subtype, it's going to tend to look like that subtype. But sometimes you can see some overlap like that. So it's more like, I, I think about the subtype as more of a continuous summary uh, in low dimension of the variations you have in your, in your data. I could have picked many other type of data dimension reduction. What I like about uh, cluster analysis like that, that I, I can inter interpret those maps really easily. They're just average of subgroups, which with a PCA or an ICA actually becomes really challenging very fast for actually reasons hinted by Pamela where I don't know where Pamela is, but her talk this morning was uh, highlighting those problems of interpretation in linear mixture models. So um, my group has not been the first to describe that by any way. There's this, uh, a, a couple of papers that we, who have reported that recently. Wang et al. Uh, in 2016 in particular. So these are three of the subtypes we found as associated with, uh, with dementia. And those are the three ones that were reported uh, by uh, Wang et al. And so that's where the open science reproducibility kicks in for a little while. Um, it's interesting that these two uh, analyses uh, coincide quite, quite well. Like here you've got the subtype with a big atrophy in the temporal pole. Uh, here you have the posterior one, here in our sample, here in their sample. And then that's the one they call the diffuse one. Uh, again, the contrast is not great on that screen, but you can see this sort of like temporal frontal uh, pattern, which you, you find here too. So they also use ADNI, but they haven't used the same set of subjects. And we used SPM to generate those maps, and they used a CVET pipeline with cortical sickness measurements. We actually also have run a CVET, our own version of CVET on the same data, and found also good convergence. The reason why we used SPM, and so that's a sort of like open science story, is that I wanted those tools to be easily reusable and reusable in an uh, industrial setting. If a company wants to use those tools and replicate what we have, I found it was very important we could do so. 
So uh, Angela Tam, the student who did that work, spent a couple of weeks disassembling SPM to get rid of all the MATLAB parts, keeping only the code that works on the octaves and build a container that replicates this pipeline. And that's on Docker Hub right now. So if you want to pick up the ANI uh, sample and run that pipeline, you should get the same maps as us because we also shared the code to do it. Um, actually, um, I have a student who left the lab to start a company and recently I was listening to him talk at a panel about uh, transitioning uh, to the industry and he was uh, complaining a bit that uh, he had to do all open science tools during his PhD and that he couldn't keep the IP from his work uh, for his company. Uh, but he, he took that pipeline which he did not develop and using it in that company. So in a way it benefited him uh, on, on other levels. Um, all right. So. Just saying. Uh, so once we've established the uh, heterogeneity here, the, the next question is can we leverage it in terms of uh, prediction? The thing is that there's a bit of a um, glass ceiling in terms of early prognosis for AD. People seem to be hovering around 80% accuracy when they try to predict progression to dementia within two, three years. And it doesn't seem to be a technique that cracks open that except papers that just don't cross-validate properly, da, da, da. Um, and it's apparent from the method section. And they do deep learning too, but anyway. Um, one way of dealing with heterogeneity would be, we, we try to make a very simple schematic that uh, illustrate um, our motivation. Christian Dansereau developed that. He was on a panel yesterday. Um, so you, you, you would have uh, uh, two labels you try to separate, uh, red dots and blue dots. And uh, here, really, you have two clear groups you can separate very easily. Uh, but there's also another subgroup where those two labels are completely mixed. If you do a simple uh, linear support vector machine, uh, what that's going to do is separate, try to make a, a trade-off in a way cut the line in two, and you're going to get a not so great accuracy. Not so bad, actually, because their accuracy is fantastic on the left, but it's kind of change level on the right, and probably you'll be at 75% accuracy if you do that with your heterogeneous data. So the idea that uh, Christian had was to say, well, what about we try to rerun that classification many times with subsets of our data and check if the classification actually is very robust on some of our subjects. And if you do that, what you'll find is that those points actually are very unstable, uh, unreliable prediction associated with them, while the left one are very hard to mess up with. Like, you know, they have very clear separated, the, the model will always converge right on those. So now what you can do is um, try to, to train a second classifier that's going to aim at just those uh, high confidence points. And what you end up doing is a classifier that picks up those red dots here, those blue dots there. So in effect, what you've done is you've traded uh, sensitivity. You're missing a lot of the red dots here consistently. For specificity, you almost never pick up blue dots. And you also gain in precision. Precision is a measure out of everything I predict is red or many are actually red. Well, here my precision is almost 100%. Well, here it was probably something like 60, 60%. Funnily enough, those numbers are what we, we face in AD. They're about 80% accurate, and they're about at 50, 60% precision. Um, so you, you, it's, it's pretty standard to do that in machine learning. Usually what people do is that they're going to look how far they are from the classification line and then try to just stay away from here. But in that configuration, if you did, with that strategy, it would perform really bad because in order to get rid of that whole cloud here, you would have to be very, very, very far from the separation line. So we found that this simple two-stage model uh, had a lot of potential, and uh, we applied that idea, and surprisingly, it's one of the first time it works like that in my career. It worked uh, almost right away um, without tweaking things much. So here are results for um, a separation of patients with dementia versus control on ANI. Uh, the top row is uh, the ANI1 sample, which has about, uh, as I said, 400 subjects. And we try a different model because actually cognitive deficit in and for themselves can distinguish those uh, uh, populations uh, very well. So here you have only structural features, only cognitive features, and a mix of cognitive and um, structural features. That's for each graph. It's like that. 
And here you have sensitivity, specificity, and precision. And so uh, every time you have two bars, on the left is a simple SVM model, and on the right is the, the model that has been pushed to be in a high confidence regime. And so what you can see is that consistently you lose in sensitivity, exactly like in the toy example. You gain in specificity, exactly like in the toy example, and uh, you gain in precision as well. Uh, cognition alone works really well. <laughs> uh, if you add structural imaging, uh, you gain a little bit into, in terms of percentages. Uh, structural imaging by itself does an okay job. Uh, so especially if you look at the, at the high uh, precision classifier, you can be 90% precise on this type of task just by looking at the MRI. And this very simple hierarchical clustering. So that's been uh, trained on that sample. And then we took our model, we didn't touch it, and we ran it on the ANI2 sample. So that's 1.5T data, that's 3T data. And uh, yeah, that data was not used at all uh, to estimate the model, the subtypes, nothing. And uh, we replicated uh, the performance almost exactly. So um, we felt, OK, so the folks that are being tagged with high confidence at dementia, can we find them now for folks who don't have dementia? Um, so we did that. We went and took the MCI sample from the ND database. And we ran our classifier and asked, do you recognize people with dementia with high confidence? And it did. So we, we stratified our sample in three. Those are the people that a linear SVM would not say have dementia. Uh, in the middle, you have the people who a linear SVM would say have dementia, but not the high confidence uh, version of the model. And on top, you have people being tagged uh, by the high confidence version of the model. And uh, what you have on the y-axis is a cognitive score uh, with the ADAS-COG, so higher is worst. And uh, on the x-axis, you have uh, time uh, after the imaging session, up to three years. And you can see that the model uh, picks people who have worse cognition to start with, which is perfectly logical. It's a machine learning that is fed cognitive variable uh, in that trying to recognize people with dementia. So those are going to have like bad cognition to start with. That's normal. But you can see that uh, they, they do um, very quickly degrade as well, while people who are tagged negative by the model are almost perfectly stable. And, and you have this nice uh, uh, sort of gradient. Uh, those error bars, I insist, are error bars of the population. They're not error bars on the mean. So you have almost like no overlap in terms of distribution of ADASCO sc scores between uh, high confidence AD subjects and, and, and control. But all those like uh, MCA patients. So we, we try to see, well, what's the actual predictive power in terms of progression to dementia? So if we look at the ANI1 and ANI2 sample, uh, if you look at the negative subjects, only 30% of them progress to dementia. Well, if we look at the high confidence subject, 93% of them will progress to dementia. And in Anidu, it was 80. Now, those, those uh, numbers, they seem quite different. But in Ani1, almost half of the FCI, MCI overall progressed. Well, in Ani2, is only like about 25%. So if we adjust our precision number to the actual prevalence of progression in the two sample, we get 80% for Ani1 and 87% in Ani2. To my knowledge, those are the highest precision metrics uh, out there at the moment, even though we are only using a simple MRI and a cognitive score. Uh, so just those are a breakdown in terms of sensitivity, specificity, and precision, just like I had shown you on AD versus control, but now for MCI progressive versus stable. Uh, we get the exact same behavior. We've essentially traded less sensitivity for more specificity and precision overall. Uh, so there's nothing special about the machine learning model we have here. It's not like a, a very like clever deep learning anything. The just idea is that we didn't choose a better model. We choose a better objective. We try to achieve high precision instead of overall accuracy on the whole sample. We move the goalpost in, 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 in a way. So uh, importantly, the models that are used to do those predictions here have never seen an MCI data set before. They were trained entirely on AD minus control on ANI1, and um, we actually had the pipeline ready before we started doing this work. So there was uh, no, no P hacking uh, involved here. That's my open science touch. Uh, I, I, 
I'm fine? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so, it really, I mean, historically, I've been mostly functional MRI research. Uh, so we tried also in functional MRI. Actually, we started by that, but I felt it made more sense to start with a structural MRI uh, study. So you can do the same kind of approach with fMRI maps. Um, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with fMRI, but if you're not, well, it's technique and give you a map. And uh, you can, but you can do it for different networks. So with structural imaging, you get one map. With functional MRI, you can get many, many, many maps. Here we get seven maps. Uh, they go by network. Here it's a network that's called the default mode network. It's a very popular network. And so that's an average across all subjects. Those are individual maps. We compute a similarity matrix across subject. We run a cluster analysis. We find three subgroups. And then we can compute averages per subgroup, which here have not been demined, which means it's a straight average. We haven't subtracted the grant average, which is on the left. So here our sample size is much smaller, though we have about 60 control and 60 patients, some of them with uh, MCI, some of them with uh, dementia. So those results are to take with a grain of salt. Unfortunately, ANI has only started doing fMRI in ANI2 and only on a third of their participants. So we suffer from a small sample size syndrome in fMRI for AD uh, in ANI. But that's how it is. So uh, for fMRI, there's a big um, concern in the community that fMRI maps are not reliable. In particular, when you're talking about short time series, and by short, I mean about seven, 10 minutes, which is what we have in, in ADNI. Um, so we took the subtypes we had generated in ADNI and went and looked at the test retest a data set that we shared openly as part of the, course, uh, the core consortium for reproducibility. So in those data, we have uh, uh, two sessions, uh, and in each session, we have two runs. So we can test to test with test reliability within and between sessions. And uh, we've generated uh, subtype weight. So how much any given subject look like any specific uh, subtype for run one, run two of the first session. And from those replication, you can uh, compute a nice C-score, and it's about 0.6, uh, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, which is moderate. moderate. Uh, is that enough to do machine learning? Well, we'll see. But it's not, it's not clear. It's, 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 no, it's not catastrophic, but it's not uh, great either. And that's very consistent with what's been said in the literature of all. Um, fMRI is you know, sort of OK, rest, uh, fMRI connectivity, but uh, not great reproducibility. So. First thing we did is just to see if there's a group-wise difference between people with dementia uh, or MCI and controls. And sure enough, there were some differences. So those differences here are illustrated by the distribution of the weight. And um, so here is from the DMN. We've got two subtypes of the DMN which are associated with dementia, one which was more present in patients, the other one more in controls. Uh, so this one is more in controls, this one is more in patients. Um, it showed differential connectivity in the DMN. That seems reasonable, consistent with the literature. The FX side, though, was uh, small to moderate. Um, so then we, we tried to mix structural MRI metrics and functional MRI metrics and not looking at cognition at all. And we've done the same kind of study we did with the structural MRI. So first of all, trying to discriminate patient methods control. And what you have here is a performance of fMRI alone, structural MRI alone, and structural MRI mixed with fMRI. So fMRI alone is bad. Uh, we, we are looking at uh, precision around 60% after we do the, the, the boosting, actually. It's like more than random on, uh, on, on the baseline. Uh, structural MRI does good, very similar to what we observed in the much more sample size uh, in the first study I presented to you. But when you combine the two, uh, you can get a boost in precision, which really relates to uh, a small boost in sensitivity here uh, and specificity there. So the best performing model was a combination of structural and functional MRI. And we are almost at 100%. Uh, precision when we use those two metrics together now to distinguish our, our cohorts. And just like before, we reused that model and then looked if we could find P 
people tagged at high confidence AD in MCI population, but we didn't train the model on MCI at all. Um, and that gave us that. Uh, out of all the MCI we had in that sample, about 33% of them progressed to dementia. And out of the people who were tagged, that's nine of them, no, 10 of them, uh, nine progressed, so that's 90%. So it's fantastic numbers in terms of 90%. It's very low numbers in terms of nine out of 10. Uh, that's just how it is. We don't have enough data. So we've been trying to publish those results for now a year and a half. I'm starting to be a bit frustrated. But we've got new data, and we're pulling everything. And soon, we'll resubmit with double the sample size, and hopefully it's going to go. Um, something interesting, though, is out of those 10 people, first of all, first of all the, the, the person who did not progress actually dropped from the study. We don't know exactly what happened to that person, but had notes uh, of constant cognitive decline. So it's almost like a nine and a half out of 10. And um, they were also all uh, AV45 positives. So that means they have uh, beta amyloid in their brain. It cost a huge lot of money to test for beta amyloid positivity. And here we only use MRI data. So if the only thing we could do with that technology is detect people who are beta amyloid positive, uh, that in it for itself is super uh, interesting for pharma. And um, we also enriched our sample for something that's called APOE4, which is a known risk of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease. So in the couple minutes uh, I have left, a uh, couple announcements on open science and reproducibility. Um, I, I really think the next level for that research is to, to look at more than just AD and controls, because people who come to the clinic, they're, they're just not in those sort of extremely stratified uh, uh, pools. So we, as part of the consortium, um, Canadian consortium on neurodegeneration in aging, we are acquiring a much more representative sample. So it's going to have uh, over 1,500 subjects. About 500 have been recruited now. And they're going to span a number of different uh, known sort of like canonical variants of dementia in aging. So we're going to have people with Alzheimer's dementia, but also frontotemporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, vascular cognitive impairment, uh, mixed uh, etiology dementia, and uh, LC controls too. Uh, so that's across, uh, acquired across Canada. We currently have 15 sites. And um, I, I really agree with what Gail was saying this morning, that if we want to train models that are going to generalize in the real life, you need heterogeneity. You need heterogeneity in terms of the background of your subjects, so biological heterogeneity, but also how you scan them. So here we have G, uh, Philips, Siemens, the whole thing, big mixture. And uh, our, in our core protocol, we do have functional and structural MRI as well as diffusion MRI. And we're going to do uh, genomics and metabolomics on those subjects. All that data is going to be available. Our first release is in schedule in a couple of weeks. I've also worked with Canadian scientists to try to generate high quality and standardized derivative based only on open tools that are free to use in an, uh, in an academic or industrial setting. So we'll get functional uh, diffusion and structural derivatives for all those folks. Our plan is to get those uh, high confidence uh, subtypes identified and also share those. And hopefully we'll be able to find uh, um, subtypes from imaging which are very closely associated with uh, clinical symptoms. Uh, a big uh, question mark is whether that's feasible at all because we're going to have all those scanners and fMRI has only a 0.5 to 0.6 ICC, which is probably not that great. So here's a little experiment in a couple of seconds. If you want to learn more, you can go see Aman uh, Preet Badwa at poster 66. She's got a full poster on this. But what that experiment shows is that we took uh, uh, data from a subject which is called Super Simon which had traveled across Canada for the past two and a half years. And uh, we've got multiple scans at certain sites from him. Hopefully soon we're going to scale up to uh, uh, over 30 sites. But right now it's uh, uh, about 15 sites. They're GE, Siemens, and uh, Philips. And we mix those data with uh, data from China, where uh, we have 30 subjects that have been scanned 10 times over a month. And then we did a fingerprinting experiment. Every time we select two scans for each subject, we generate functional connectivity map in different networks. We do cluster analysis, and we see if the two subjects, well, the two scans of the same subjects have been paired together. We can do that for every subject. So the box plot shows you the distribution for seven networks in the brain. The box plot are for the HNU1, the Chinese sample. 
they all scan at the same place. And the red dots are supersimon. So that means that if you look a map of the science network, you can almost say that supersimon is supersimon and not somebody from China uh, with you know, about 90% uh, accuracy. Um, despite the fact that it's been scanned over two years and a half all over Canada on every single manufacturer. So is 0 0.5, 0 0.6 ICC good enough? Well, for f fingerprinting, that is. Uh, well, and uh, there's a paper from CAMH which just came out uh, that showed that, but there are four traveling phantoms. So here we did this bit of mix and match experiment with different data set because we only had one traveling subject. Uh, but they only have three sites, we have 13. So, but it's very convergent. So to conclude, with large sample, you can reliably identify subtypes of brain phenotypes, structure and function. And I really believe there's a, is those fully data-driven uh, subtypes, they're not that exciting in for itself. They're only weakly to moderately associated with clinical symptoms. But if you look at specific subgroup who share a signature of different subtypes, then you can find signatures that are highly predictive of clinical condition and uh, both in diagnosis and prognosis. And you don't know, need fancy machine learning model. All you need is tweak your model to be less sensitive and more specific. I believe it would be still great to have deep learning models that could learn complex mixture. What I said really works if you have two clear groups and noise. Uh, so it's a limitation. And um, open uh, science tools <laughs> Uh, have been a uh, key in all that work. It's all open data we've used, and hopefully we're going to be able to give back to the community and help uh, the community reach the next stage with the CCNA study. Thank you very much. Thanks for the great talk about open science and reproducible um, science. <laughs> we, have, we have time for a few questions. Uh, yeah, so I have two questions. Uh, first question is, when are you going to be satisfied with the ADNI-1 performance metrics? Like, is there a point where you say this is what humans are probably doing themselves in terms of diagnosis, especially between MCI and AD, which I presume is not consistent across uh, physicians? So if you compare uh, AD diagnosis based on cognition and based on looking at what people have there in their brain when you cut them, uh, you, you, your accuracy is actually pretty bad. Mm -hmm. You have, I mean, depending how picky you are to define AD pathology, but about half of people with a deep dementia don't have AD pathology. So I, I don't think we can hope to build a machine learning model that would perfectly predict our clinical levels. If we do, we are probably not actually predicting what we're interested in, yeah. right? Uh, so the point of that talk was to say we need to maybe like shift our objectives and maybe we cannot do accurate prediction for all of the subject, mm -hmm. but maybe we can find some like of at risk type. Uh, the, 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 the analogy I do with, is with, uh, with uh, genes. Uh, you have some genes which are very low penetrance. They are associated, but they explain maybe 1% of the phenotype. Mm -hmm. And others, you have it, you're going to have Alzheimer's disease every time and within a window of five years. I believe there are those high penetrance subtypes in brain phenotypes. We just haven't discovered them yet. That's the point of that talk. Okay. Uh, and follow-up question, a bit unrelated, is if you could say something, because you mentioned a lot about uh, discovering subtypes in this. Uh, I wonder if you could compare that with the um, event-based model work from the group in London, for it, which covers more the disease progression, like this ah, indexing. Oh, all right. So yeah, there's a number of multivariate model of disease progression, including we have a very uh, prominent researcher here, uh, Yasser Turia Medina, who was working in Alan Evans' group. Um, and those two works are fascinating in that they're, they're linking many facets of the disease. Uh, as far as I know, they haven't been evaluated as predictive tools. Uh, and so, you know, I don't really have a comparison to make in terms of the metrics I care about as of now. I, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but if I am, please find me and correct me. Uh, One more while the next speaker is setting up. Yeah. Hi. Pierre. 
Thank you for the for the talk, Pierre. Um, just there, there's one point that I didn't uh, understand is the, the 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 idea of heterogeneity, and you know the different scanning acquisition protocols and all that. In your cluster discovery group, do you want to have a lot of heterogeneity or not? I, I didn't catch that part. So the question is, do we really want a lot of heterogeneity in the discovery group? And I would say yes. We have a study on schizophrenia. Uh, Pierre Aubin is the first author that clearly demonstrates that heterogeneity in the sort of training sample helps for generalizability of the findings. Now, uh, here we sort of took two extremes, controls and people with dementia. And uh, I think that helps the model because it's a fully data-driven model. So you, you want the clinical phenotypes to actually explain a lot of variance in your data. So I don't think that necessarily the UK biobank, which, which is just a general population sample, would be the best to find subtypes of, of, of dementia. Actually, for rare forms of dementia, they will have very few subjects. Even though they have 100,000 individuals, they will have very few with frontotemporal dementia in there in the end because it's just a very rare condition. So then just maybe just a, a follow-up question then. The, in your testing and when your validation data set, do you also want to have a lot of heterogeneity or presumably if you've captured it well with your cluster discovery group, then you can just you know, use whatever? Uh, so I don't have a strong opinion. The reason why we did what we did, which is control versus demented patients and then look how it goes in MCI is that people before us did it. Uh, so we just followed kind of like what's been done in the field. Uh, there's probably a clever way of doing it, but I haven't talked about it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh. Oh, wait. Hi, Pierre. Entertaining talk as always. Uh, it seems to me that the, the holy grail here is to associate those uh, be, uh, uh, functional connectivity subtypes with behavioral subtypes. So could you speak a little bit to that? We want to get at the mechanism, mechanisms of the disorders rather than just classifications thereof. Yeah. So yeah, uh, indeed, clearly, here we are just focusing on clinical diagnostics, those kind of like very binary entity. Uh, it'd be a lot of fun to subtype behavior. And, and I, we've tried to do that on HCP data with activation maps and the battery of, of uh, behavioral measures. And we found that the assessions are pretty weak. And I think that's consistent with what the Oxford group have, has reported. They report you know, significant as usual because you have a thousand subjects, but the, the actual association are, are pretty weak. Um, so yeah, I don't know. There may be, as I said, some aspects of behavior on which you have a high penetrance from uh, brain uh, phenotypes and some others where it's really education, school you've done, stuff like that. And yeah, I don't have a clear view on which aspects of behavior we should focus on. All I can say is that, yeah, in terms of big phenotypes like Alzheimer, we've had some success with that technique. And when we try to do the same thing with more like simple, sort of like endedness, well, you know, that didn't work so well. Uh, to be continued. OK. Uh, Hi, it's me. So, thank you for the talk. I have one question regarding the features for functional MRI. Uh, could you tell more about uh, what did you use for each subject? Because you talked about different networks. Uh, absolutely. So we use seed-based connectivity map like Barad Bisval in 95 uh, after standard preprocessing and using a, an entire network as a seed uh, from a group level atlas, which are freely available. Open. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. Let's thank um, Pierre again.